Greetings, brothers and sisters. So this is another um, video where the title is is given at the beginning of the video. It's a thread that not only runs through this video, but you know all my videos and all of what's going on in the world right now. And that is, they're not changing the rules, they're changing the game. And so on a superficial level, on a lower level, the they is what I call the controllers. It is the, you know, people that appear to run the world in the system. But on a larger level, the they is God and the higher developed beings that work for God, that make sure that, you know, planet, in this case, Earth, and, you know, whatever's going on in the universe stays on a divine course. And this is significant because most, most people in the so-called truth community focus on the elite, I would say. 90%, you know, what they call the elite, what I call the controllers, they focus on them, which is wrong because it's not being truthful. If you're going to be truthful, there is a divine reason for everything that's going on in this planet. There is, you know, a plan. God has a plan, and what's happening now that's undesirable that people attribute only to the so called elite, things that people don't want to, you know, face up to, changes that are, are occurring things that people don't want to give up, and they think it's just coming from the so-called elite, but it's really coming from God. Like they are, you know, in a sense, the instruments for changes that if you are honest about what's going on with the human race and the planet, you would say, yeah, these changes need to happen even though I don't want them to happen, even though it's not best for me as a human being and an ego, they're not changes that are going to make my life better. So instead of seeing God's hand behind all these things, people say, well, you know, it's the elite, right? They're doing these undesirable things. And, you know, we can stop them or we can change it. And, you know, they're doing wrong, which is, you know, fundamentally dishonest. And so it's always easier for people to look at the opposite side, to see your enemy or people you don't agree with and see their hypocrisy and see how they're, you know, not getting it done. I mean, that's always the one of the downfalls of humanity where people are oblivious to their own, <laughs> you know, inability to accept God's divine plan. People are good at seeing other people who can't do that. It's easy for people on the right to see, you know, people on the left and, you know, the left seeing people on the right but the inability to look at what owns one's own self and the collective belief system that you're in. You know, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were traveling and we stopped in this um, kind of, a, I don't know, a bread and breakfast place and it had like farm to table stuff and, you know, it was organic and it had neat owners and we had a good conversation. It was a couple. They were liberal leaning people. They were liberals, but they had, you know, there were some element of, connectivity through the organic farming and there's things that are shared common ground that we could have conversation about right and the guy was wearing a mask he didn't you know make us wear masks but he was wearing a mask and he said that he hadn't gotten covid yet so therefore he was going to stick with his mask working and that's not a scientific approach so this is a science person right a liberal person who is scientific in orientation, right? The liberals and the left and the Democrats are the party of science, right? They're always talking about science and they're, you know, against religion and superstitious thinking. But that superstition that he thinks because he hadn't gotten COVID yet, and of course he could have gotten it and not known. I mean, there's all these, you know, variations of that. But he was thinking because he hadn't gotten it yet, that the mask was the reason for it. And that is in science. There's no science behind that. That's superstition. And there's so much superstition. They talk about, the left talks about the right being very superstitious and religion is no, you know, the various levels of belief in God and, you know, religion and so much of what the right does is emotionally based and superstitious in nature. They have superstitions that are at the basis of their belief system. But the left that says, well, we're all about science, if you really talk to them, like just average people who are democratic and, you know, celebrities or Hollywood celebrities or any of these people, you'll find that they're 
highly superstitious, overwhelmingly superstitious. People who, so many people believe in luck in one way or another. Like you'll see, um, there's a lot of athletes that'll think they have lucky socks or they'll practice some ritual that they think is in charge of making a, you know, making them play better and, you know, having the breaks go their way. I mean, there's a lot of superstition in sports with athletes, but all across our culture. And what this guy was saying was there was only one explanation for his not getting COVID, or at least the one that he was most focused on, was that wearing a mask had prevented him from getting COVID. It was working. The mask was working, and there's no evidence to support that. Because what the CDC had said a while back was that to get COVID, the most, you know, the highest risk of getting COVID was prolonged exposure to somebody who had it for 15 minutes, being in close proximity of those people for six feet or under for 15 minutes. It didn't matter whether you wore a mask at all. The mask wasn't even a factor. But the reason the masks were given, I mean, there's lots of reasons from their side, but you see that people are superstitious about it because people want to do something. They have this fear. They have all this anxiety. And so doing something that keeps you safe, like the idea of keeping you safe, reduces the anxiety. So many people are freaked out right now about COVID, you know, more so than you would think, especially on the left, because they're believing what they hear in the news, but even people on the right. And so people are wanting to do something, do anything. And even without knowing why or the science behind it, putting on a mask feels protective for them, right? It feels like, okay, this is stopping the COVID from getting into my system. And even when the masks were first rolled out, they said, well, it doesn't do anything for you. It just protects other people. That's how they sold them at first. But later they came and changed their story. But it's not, this isn't really about masks. It's about the group mentality. This is, you know, I made videos about this before where people on the left associate non-mask wearing with right-wing people and Trumpers. And so you've had all these people on the left and stores like Whole Foods that are all about natural alternative stuff, alternative food and alternative medicines. I mean, Whole Foods, about 80% of it is eating things that are, you know, different than mainstream farm production and mainstream medicine, allopathic medicine. They have a whole huge section of remedies that are not based in the allopathic model. And they sell things like elderberry syrup that you know, elderberry extract that Fauci said doesn't work. Fauci said none of those herbs work, right? I mean, this is, you know, the allopathic perspective that, you know, what now has become traditional medicine, pharmaceutical medicine perspective, right? But you had all these liberal people that weren't into traditional medicine, allopathic medicine. They are much more into herbs and homeopathy and acupuncture and all these things. But when they saw that Trump was on one side and Fauci was on the other and science was on one side and the left was on one side, they just accepted that side. The same thing with the right. People on the right were like, okay, the left is pushing this, so I'll be on the other side. You understand this, but it's people not like thinking about what they believe. Would you believe in regular traditional medicine? Because I think people on the right are more prone to be on the side of allopathic medicine and people on the left are more on the side of herbalism and these other alternative healing modalities. I mean, it's not, you know, that black and white, but I think percentages, the left would be more into alternative medicine, but the left has embraced. And I was, you know, I I made a video about this, all these people, you know, some of them I know that have embraced what goes against what they believe. And the same thing with people on the right. If Trump was for it or the, you know, Nancy Pelosi was against it, then they would be for it or whatever, vice versa or whatever it is. And that's not really assessing what you believe. It's just you put yourself in this group and you look at what your group is doing and you just blindly follow along with the other group members without thinking why you're doing it. You know, is this actually effective on a scientific level if you believe in science or on a a spiritual level, if you believe in God, or both, if you, you know, believe in both, right? 
using your heart. I mean, this is, you know, I talk about the heartfulness meditation because in the heartfulness system, science isn't considered bad or evil. Science is a part of it, right? Science and spirituality and the spirituality of science and the science of spirituality are both really important to bring God into science and also bring science, a scientific mind, into spiritual pursuit, which both can happen. The blending of the two where both have value, right? Material science and spiritual science, both are necessary. Both are part of one's decision-making process. You can use your heart, you can use your mind, you can use your gut, all of these things to interpret what's going on around you. So to you know, return to the central premise of this video, that they're not changing the rules, they're changing the game. And so there are lots of times where the people who control the system and then the godly forces, the divine forces that are really controlling what's going on here. And not controlling, but guiding. Like that's the difference. There's, a, there's guidance, guiding in the right direction because human beings have freedom of choice. And then there's also, then there's controlling. And that's something that people who are trying to usurp God's, you know, the divine order. So when anybody exhibits control of something, and tries to take it in a way that it's not supposed to go, that is, you know, that would be considered devil worship. Like, you know, it's like where your ego is taking things, trying to force things in a different direction than the divine plan. And that's people on the right, people in the truth community. Every one of us at some point of our life, and, and usually quite often, has a desire, has something we want, or we think things are supposed to go a certain way. And... As things unfold, God says that, you know, God shows us that there's a different plan. The events unfold and that there's a different plan. It's, the not, it's not the one that we have. And we get bummed out, right? We get upset and we, you know, blame it on other things than God. But really, deep down, we know it's about God. We know that we have difficulty accepting God's plan. And so in this case, it's the game that's changing. It's not the rules of the game. It's the game itself. In fact, the one game is coming to an end. You know, the rules of engagement, right? Games people play. And they've been changing the rules of the game for a long time, but now the game itself is changing. And there is a controller aspect, the people who control the system, who are changing, the, you know, changing the game because, you know, they realize that the game is insolvent, right? That it, you know, can't go on. That they you know, need to change the game in terms of their ability to survive what's about to happen, the collapse of a system. But they're doing this because there is a divine reason why the game is changing. The game has to change. And it goes far beyond what the controllers, you know, have control over. You know, they're trying to cut themselves a deal. They're trying to control things because that's what they do. But like I said, all of us do this. We control things, try to control things that go against God's will. And in the case of the truth community or people on the right, oh, it's the elite, the elite are doing this, the elite. The elite are all powerful. Well, this system sucks and it needs to go. It's just that simple. This system is bad for us. You should know this by now. Like the system is bad for us. I don't want the system to go because I'm dependent on it. I don't want the system to collapse because I, you know, know how hard it is to survive, you know, and it might be better than I think, but I know it's going to be difficult, especially for someone in my age bracket, because I've done some homesteading and I've done some, you know, things that are, that are um, self-sufficient types of things. And I know that they're enjoyable to do, but not when, you, you know, you have to do it all day, every day, and it's a huge learning curve to be self-sufficient or to, you know, get off the, the, you know, the dependence on the beast to remove your beast addiction, the beastly system, because we all have a beast addiction. And there's things in the beast that we're addicted to that only the beast can provide for us. Like it might be coffee, right? You, you know, are you going to grow coffee? Well, probably not, right? Coffee only grows in selective places or tea or whatever it is. So caffeine and things like this, right? And so, you know, any number of foods that are either processed foods or things that come from a, you know, for, uh, you know, a far off place, 
I mean, what you can grow locally, what you can consume, what you can, you know, the things that you enjoy, TV, being on the internet, whatever it might be, right? All these things that people are addicted to and there'd be some withdrawal, medications, alcohol. I mean, these are things, you know, maybe you could make moonshine or whatever, but is that really the direction you want to go in? <laughs> I mean, is that, <laughs> you know, you're a, you're a wine drinker and you're going to substitute that with homemade moonshine. <laughs> you know, so we have um, addictions to the beast in the system that only the beast can provide for us. And it'd be really hard for us to replace those things. And so the idea of the system collapsing is overwhelming. Most people don't have a clue of what they would do if the system collapsed and you no longer had electricity, you no longer could drive your car, you no longer had a job, your money was worthless, there was no longer stores the way that we have it, and you'd have to figure things out. And so most people just hearing that, their stress level, they either have to just like block it out and say, yeah, that will never happen, or I don't want to think about that. Or they get overwhelmed and their stress level goes through the roof. And it's everybody's inability to accept what needs to happen in a divinely controlled system, a system with a plan that it, you know, the system's bad for all of us. And it's, you know, it's run its course, right? We understand that there's no, you know, real benefit on a spiritual level for this system. So the first piece to this is most people think that death is bad. The end of things is bad. So most people associate God with creation, God, the creator, God, the, you know, preserver, you know, God creates and then maintains. I've talked about this before that God creates something and then it's preserved and maintained and you want it to go on forever. And the end of that thing, the end of your enjoyment, the end of your life, the end of your enjoying something, the end of a, you know, something that you like is bad and comes from the devil or the controllers comes from, you know, human representation of the devil, and that death and destruction are the devil, and creation and preservation are from God. And it's a huge flaw. I mean, so many religious people believe this. They believe in God, but they believe death is bad. And they believe destruction is bad, change is bad, right? They believe that God is going to preserve for them a lifestyle that they've become attached to, that we've become attached to, right? I've said this before, that the people who control the system gave everybody a false promise. Our ancestors, you know, when they were lured off the farm and off the whatever, the, the tribal situation, the village-based, family-oriented agrarian systems that people used to live in, and they were lured into cities, right? They were, in the modern economy, there's this, unwritten, unsaid promise that the system would always be there for you. And you grew up with this. We grew up, I grew up with this, that the system that we're 100% dependent on would always be there. That when your you know ancestors left the farm and they gave up all these intergenerational family skills that they passed down from generation to generation, the farming skills and all the rest of it, the social skills, living in an agrarian community, when you, you know, got rid of all those things and now you had one specialized job where you would make money and you, that's all you'd ever need. The money would always be there. You know, you would stack away, you would hoard some of this money in retirement when you no longer could work and that was going to last you until you died and you could enjoy this lifestyle forever, that the system would always be there. And even now, I mean, that's how they sell it to people and the game's changing the system is collapsing and then all these skills that you you know no longer i mean they're not even something that your parents knew right your parents didn't really have much of these skills and your grandparents you know maybe a little bit but you have almost nothing in terms of surviving outside the beastly system and so there's this idea that god promised for many people and at least the people that control the system promised or the system itself promised it would always be there for you and it won't be right <laughs> and so now you have a weakened underskilled underdeveloped group of people especially each generation getting worse that is going to have to face up to relearning all these types of skills 
and you know connecting to God and have a totally different understanding of how the world works and their purpose here. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's your purpose because each person has a purpose. You have a soul's purpose and that's for you to find out. Like it's your purpose. It's not what I say your purpose is. You know how you have parents who have a purpose for their kids or they want things for their kids and you know, parents who live vicariously through their kids and want them to be famous athletes or good athletes or, you know, whatever it is, celebrities, children, you know, children, actors, and they force this stuff on their kids, you know, and maybe the kids have this some scars or the kids certainly have this some scars for it to some extent, at least to go through the experience. Like the kids, you know, whatever your parents do with you is something that your spiritual some scars, I've talked about these before, your impressions from you know previous existence are there, and th- those experiences that you go through are part of your soul's plan. And so there's no victimization in the sense that everything you experience has to be inside of you. You can't experience something that isn't a part of your internal world. But what happens is, almost immediately when you are on planet Earth, you're, you're a baby, whatever, but as soon as you start to gain consciousness, people lose sight of their soul's plan. It's happened over and over again. You have spiritual beings, higher developed spiritual beings. They came down to earth, and within a short period of time, they forget why they're here. They disconnect from their soul, and they start enjoying themselves on planet earth, and they think enjoying themselves and indulging is why they're here. And that's been sold to you by the system. The system is about indulgence and happiness and pleasures just you know 100 percent of the time and that's not what life on earth is about and so our whole understanding of why we're here you know the pursuit of happiness happiness isn't ever been the goal it's never been the goal of your soul right your soul has never said just go down to earth and enjoy yourself that's about pleasure and sensory stimulation you have a spiritual goal and your soul's purpose for your life here is that you get closer to God, that the soul moves closer to God through understanding all the, you know, the workings of the divine system through a materialistic world where they can have 3D representation and experience these things. Anger and sadness and disappointments and miseries, right? I mean, everybody thinks that you're supposed to win 100% of the time and you're always supposed to be successful. And if you lose, society looks at you, look at that loser over there. Look at that failure. You have athletes that make a mistake at a crucial time in a game and they're labeled a choker right and you know most of these things all of these things are part of a plan right like you you couldn't do anything to change them but how you experience those things is what's important how you experience them inside of yourself because you're not supposed to win 100 percent of the time you're not supposed to be successful 100 percent of the time in fact it's your failures and disappointments that are there to, you know, allow you to move forward on your spiritual journey because you get a lot more out of disappointments than you do out of success. In fact, success builds the ego and gives people an unrealistic perception that they can control things that they can't control. And so people come down to planet Earth, soul comes down to planet Earth, and it has a, you know, it has a role to play and 99% of the lives that are lived, 99.9, I don't know, it's a very high percentage, almost 100%, people don't live that plan. They don't fulfill that plan. And that plan could be that you're a villain, right? That plan, your role on this life could be that you're a villain. There's been higher developed souls that have come down as a villain because of what needed to happen in a divine drama. And so that's why we shouldn't be looking at the controllers or anybody else and you know, thinking that they're not doing God's bidding, because certainly the system being taken down is a part of God's will. Because it sucks. This system is bad for all of us. We're we're addicted to it. Like I said, I don't want it to collapse, but I understand why it needs to. And there is a distinction, right? You know, the my in terms of my human survival and my human comforts, I don't want the system to collapse. But on a spiritual level and just, you know, a heart-based level and intellectual level as well, I can look at everything that's going on, and you can too, and see how bad the system is for everybody and why it's a bad system and takes people away from their divine purpose. 
And so people start thinking that, you know, things are, one things are bad and other things are good. And they associate God with creation and God with preservation and the devil with destruction. And that perpetual happiness and utopia and where nothing changes, you never suffer any loss, you never suffer any tragedy, you never suffer any misery is the way it should be. And there's something wrong with the system because you're unhappy and you get disappointed and things don't go the way that you think they should go. And that's because people have lost their connection to the divine and they are, you know, thinking that they can manifest the world, control the world, control their lives in a way that is, you know, ego-based and not soul-based. And that's 100% the problem now on planet Earth, that people are trying to control things they shouldn't control, control the outcome of things instead of surrendering to God and allowing what's supposed to happen, happen. Like I said, there are higher developed souls that come down and be saints, you know, they're saintly people. And they're recognized for their divinity, and they get propped up by, you know, the horde, the masses. They get put up on a pedestal because the people recognize them as a higher developed soul. And what's happened, you know, so many times, and even with famous divine beings that have started religions that people think are so great, that they end up forgetting about doing their godly purpose and role, and they end up trying to please their fans please the people that they're there, you know, not to serve, but they're there to serve God, but they start serving the people. And so they forget about God and then they get embedded, they get, you know, connected in a dysfunctional way, right? They get into these codependent relationships with their followers and they forget about what they're there to do, their divine purpose. It happens over and over again. So even higher developed souls get trapped here on planet Earth and they forget about why they're here. They forget about what their true purpose is. And so that's 99.9% .9 of the population is not doing what they're supposed to do. And so it's not like it has to be 100%. You could be 20% on your soul's path and 80% about your ego, right? But even that is, you know, that's a very high ratio for most people. And so the idea that God has a plan for you and your soul has a plan and that you you know, you aren't going to see it very clearly. And so you have to do things. You have to, all right, this seems to be like what God's plan is for me. And you start working and then you have some failure or, you know, or maybe the reason why you started doing something is a little bit of a selfish reason. And later on, that gets more purified, right? Because then you become, you know, clearer about what God wants you to do through some failure and through some disappointment and some mirroring back from your experience god mirrors back your soul mirrors back you know some of your your faulty thinking your faulty character qualities and you clean those things up and you all right then you get a more pure reason for doing what you're supposed to do in your goals but even then you know is it something that you're supposed to succeed at because in the heartfulness system one of the great things is you do the work and leave the results to god and what happens is like you have a lot of cultures around the world that don't do the work because they're very fatalistic. They have a lot of faith in God, but they don't do anything themselves. They, oh, it's only God's will, right? It's it's Allah's, Allah's will, it's, you know, whatever it is, right? This passive way of not doing anything because you just leave everything up to God, which is good in a way, but it's not, you know, being honest of why you're here. And so you're supposed to attempt to interpret what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to follow a path you're supposed to work for success and then you turn it over to God and whatever the results are, you accept them, right? So you do the work, but ultimately the results are God's. And so you have some work to do. You understand, you figure out what the work is. And maybe, you, you know, maybe you're not clear. Maybe you got something wrong. Maybe, you know, you didn't see it the way it was supposed to be seen. You know, maybe it's just an idea that's there, but it wasn't supposed to be, you know, it wasn't going to be a successful venture. And so you do the work to succeed at what you think you're supposed to do. And then you get feedback from that. And you have experience and you accept it. And you say, all right, God, now I'm, I'm clearer about what I'm supposed to do. And so you, you, know, you make some adjustments and you change your focus a little bit, your goal, and you move forward. But the idea should always be that even you know, if you are successful, it doesn't last forever. That things need to change, things end, things die. Again, this idea of 
God as the creator, you know, in the Hindu, Hindu tradition, there's Brahma, the creator, there is Vishnu, the preserver, the maintainer, and there's Shiva, the destroyer, and all things are necessary. Destruction is necessary. Death is necessary. Change is necessary. The end of things is necessary. But when something is good and you have good relationships or you love somebody and those things end in one way or another, there's, you know, somebody dies or, you know, eventually things end and, you know, you have to be able to accept the ending of something, especially your own life, because that's happened in everybody. You know, it's the only thing that's guaranteed people is that at some point you're going to die. And so accepting that you're going to die, accepting this inevitability is essential to one's process and ultimately preparing for it because, you know, it's a transition from physical life to spiritual life. And so I look at these things differently than most truthers. Most people who present videos or, or whatever they do, you know, or most of you. It's a hyper focus on the people that you call the elite, right? Or the deep state or whatever, you know, QBs or whatever, you know, people think about what's going on. But there is always a divine purpose underneath what's going on. And so even these people who are, you know, evil in nature, they can't help but do or serve the system and the purpose, right? The divine system. They can't help but to, at least in part, contribute to the divine plan. Their actions are even being dictated because they're the most easy to control. You know, they're the most easy to guide in a certain direction because of their egocentric nature. And when spiritual beings come down here, higher developed spiritual beings, they can manifest things on the planet in ways they can't when they're just etheric beings. So when a saint or a spiritual master comes down here, they can do changes to the world. They can, you know, they can rewrite the plan. They can rewrite the script. They can make adjustments because sometimes things need to, you know, be adjusted, right? The things have to be in flux. The divine plan needs to be updated or whatever it is, right? It's just like anything else. There's, you know, ways that, all right, there's, you know, contingencies and there's, you know, unpredictable outcomes and there's the freedom of choice of the people. And the problem with religions is that the being, the, the, the person, uh, you know, the essence of a soul, the soul that came down and started the religion is no longer on the physical planet. And so is limited in w what the work they can do. And that's why, you know, religions, whatever your religion is, is only a small piece of the puzzle because there are always going to be spiritual movements and there are always going to be higher developed souls that come down to guide humanity in the right direction. And there's always saints on this planet that get orders from God and they manifest things. They get orders from, you know, a team of higher developed souls that are overseeing this planet and they do things like start wars they do things that you know natural disasters they remake the planet and this is something Bobji, the second master of the heartfulness system has done right he was given these orders and he was you know a blessing for the what they call the spiritual hierarchy and you know god's will in the fact that he didn't question anything he would just receive these divine plans these divine orders and he would just execute these things on a spiritual level and manifest change. And part of what he was in charge of was bringing down the system, which when I read about this made sense, but you know, it was years ago in the 1990s when it wasn't so obvious that this was gonna happen, you know, in the very near future, like what's happening right now. And that there was a divine will to bring about a transformation in the human species and bring them up to a higher level of consciousness that even on a genetic level, people of the future will be changed. People will be, you know, extraordinarily different than we are now. People look the same for the most part, but in terms of what's inside of them and what their, you know, primary function is and the activation of all these, you know, there's all this junk DNA that has a divine purpose, right? These, you know, it's potential that's just dormant right now will be, you know, activated. So there'll be a, a change in evolution and people will, have a, you know, a much more higher capacity for spiritual development and ability to connect to God and accept the divine truth. Because most people, when you tell them the truth, they are oblivious to it, right? 
I mean, you can experience this in your own life with people that you're trying to wake up or whatever it is, and you have sheeple relatives or, you know, NPCs, non-player character relatives and friends, and you talk to them and they just can't get it. But what about the things you can't get and the things that you can't hear, right? <laughs> like you're only locked into this paradigm where there's elite people that are in charge of destroying everything. I mean, who are, you know, controlling everything and they're not doing God's work and they're working against whatever's happening and what you think should happen or what your group of people should happen. But that's not the case at all, right? The destruction of this system was inevitable and certainly necessary. It's a system that can't be fixed, even though we love it or we are addicted to it and we can't imagine life without it. But at some point we have to, right? At some point we have to, you know, embrace the fact that this is changing and accept the inevitable destruction of our system and prepare our kids, you know, prepare ourselves, obviously, but our kids, more importantly, our kids and their grandkids for this change, right? Accepting that this is a part of the divine plan and that we can change and adapt. It's inside of us as hard as it might be. Maybe it, you know, will be something that we'll really enjoy. Maybe when the system collapses, we'll be like, oh, I'm so much happier now, right? And so, you know, it's, it's just the end of something and everything comes to an end. Everything dies and the system's dying right now. We have this period of time to adjust ourselves, gather ourselves so that we can successfully navigate this change. And, you know, we have a system, the heartfulness system is here. Again, it's a piece in the divine. You know, there's all these pieces of a divine puzzle. It's not one guy. It's not one movement, right? It's not Buddha. It's not Jesus. It's not Krishna. It's not, you know, a one-off. It is a, you know, a series of spiritual movements that have been given to the human species to help them navigate through this spiritual evolutionary process that's happening here. And the heartfulness system has been given at this time and the divine energy, the transmission that's given and the cleaning that's given to help people accept what's going on, right? To prepare them for a deepening of their internalized relationship with God where you can get direct orders from the source, where you can get direct instructions and you can more easily identify your you know, your soul's plan and your role in this world and get information directly from the source, something that religions are blocking you from receiving because they want power and control on a materialistic level. Religions are 99% materialistic. And so you can go through your life blaming the elite and, you know, saying that this is all about man's poor choices and leadership problem. <laughs> it's not just leadership. It's all of us, right? Because most people have lost touch with their true purpose on planet Earth and are just here indulging and enjoying and thinking that life is only about pleasure and having things that we like and things that we dislike are you know, somehow coming from the devil or the so-called elite. And that's because we have a fundamental misunderstanding what our purpose here. And so understanding there is a divine force, there is a divine system behind the collapse of our beastly system makes it, you know, easier, and more palatable to go through. And then you figure out, okay, when I'm no longer going to be dependent on this system, what is the new system going to look like? What is my life going to look like when there's no grocery stores or there's no electricity or there's no, you know, any of these things, right? What is my life going to look like? What is, you know, it's going to be a locally based situation. What happens if you, you no longer could get on the internet? Like, look at how easily people came addic became addicted to the internet. It's only been around, you know, for, what, 30 years now? And, and it's just growing, and it's, uh, you know, it's overtaking people's conscious, awaking life, right? People spending more and more time on the internet and something that isn't going to last for, you know, a very long time. And so what's your life going to look like when you don't have the internet? What's your life going to look like if, you know, you can't drive your car or whatever. So everything's going to have to shift back to a more local situation. And even if the changes aren't that drastic, you know, what kind of ways can you change your life and your orientation to life to embrace your soul's purpose and the changes that inevitably come like death itself, right? See, right now people have this idea, you enjoy, you enjoy, you enjoy, you indulge, you indulge, you indulge. 
and then you die when you can't you know you can't indulge anymore i remember seeing my dad who was you know somebody who really struggled had a lot of fear of death and things and going to see him you know maybe six months or a year before he died and he enjoyed food right he was you know half Sicilian and he liked to eat and he liked TV and he could no longer see he is you know his eyesight was basically gone and he had multiple digestive issues like irritable bowel and autoimmune stuff so he couldn't really enjoy food anymore like he couldn't really digest it and he withered away to nothing he had a big you know pot belly and you know and he couldn't watch TV and he couldn't really enjoy physical life right but you could see he was terrified of death. He looked like a skeleton when I saw him. Right? I was shocked. Like I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. He just deteriorated. But he couldn't indulge or enjoy in physical pleasures anymore. And his mind was, you know, going or whatever, right? And yet he was too scared to die, right? He wasn't prepared for death and all these things, right? And so, you know, he was just lingering in this, you know, limbo where he was being kept alive by a medical system that is, you know, that can prolong somebody's death but they've already sort of died in every possible way right they're no longer you know who they were as a person they're not really cognizant they can't enjoy things they can't you know interact with people and they you know oftentimes are miserable and grumpy and you know they've lost their purpose and they're just in a fear-based state and you know they're not making the transition in a, a sort of dignified and effective way where they're connected to their soul and they're connected to higher developed spiritual beings we all have a spiritual support system higher developed etheric beings and of course human beings that are here in a, in physical body who are a part of our spiritual support system right people who you know we feel real comfortable around right and some of those people could be you know souls that we feel familiar with and can, can comfortable around but they're not we don't have good relationships on a human level right so sometimes we're supposed to have a bad marriage we might have a soul that we're connected to, a soul that we feel familiar with, and it's a you know a plan for us to marry this person. But the plan isn't that we're going to have a blissful marriage and we're going to have a good relationship, even though there's a soul connection and even though this is a part of God's plan. But then there's times that people imagine that they're supposed to be with somebody that they really don't have any connection with. And so they end up marrying somebody that they have a very you know, a limited connection with, you know, somebody who is, they don't have any past lives with, they don't have any spiritual connection with them, or very, very slight connection. But they, they just convince themselves, they lie to themselves, that this was the person they were supposed to marry. And so these are the two versions of, mi of miserable marriages, right? And there's also career choices like this and all these other things. Where you think you want to do something, and you, you know, deny and you, you push back against all the signs and all the information that's coming back at you to tell you not to do something, but you really want to do it and you force it. I mean, forcing something that isn't part of your soul's plan and God's plan is responsible for so much of the confusion and miseries on planet Earth. And then, you know, being in perpetual denial of your mistake, right? never coming to terms with what you did, that you've tried to force something, that there was no spiritual backing for it, and then it falls apart because it's supposed to, right? It was was not, it's an abomination. You made a bad choice, but then you have to live with the consequences, and it could be having kids with somebody that you were never connected to. Or you could just have bad marriage some scars, and you're supposed to marry somebody, that there was no chance of you ever having a good marriage. It was just always going to be miserable and but that's part of the plan. And it's understanding this and being able to accept these things, especially when you start coming out the other end of it and seeing what was inside of you that created the mistake or created this, you know, negative experience and allowing it to be cleaned out so that you can have a, you know, better experiences or more productive experiences in the future. And so this is what I'm talking about. Like there's, you know, people's obsession in the truth community with the so-called elite and how they're destroying the world but are you are you not destroying it like what are you doing that's making the world a better place like what are your responsibilities in this and you know and most people on the internet they just want to blame other people's and just they have venom inside of them and they just want to take it out on other people 
and they, you know, can't hear the truth. They lash out at people when they, you know, even somebody like me was talking in a general way, but there's people getting butthurt about this, what I'm saying, and they'll leave comments because they can't t look at themselves and realize that the emotional reaction they're having is because I'm telling them something that they can't handle, but is actually good for them. This is medicine for them, but they reject it and they spit back poison because that's all they can do. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.